uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor uh, Bob Fritz from UCSF, UCSF and uh, Gladstone uh, Research Institute. Bob uh, did his undergraduate at uh, uh, University of Florida, and then he went to do, finish his uh, medical degree at uh, Vanderbilt University. He actually uh, spent four years in Colorado to finish his residency, and then he decided to become more involved with research. So he picked up a fellowship and uh, started his lab work in, uh, in uh, the Gladstone Institute, where he developed gene targeting for the institute, and he made the Apple B lock of mice. Um, in, from two, 1994, he started his own lab and uh, as assistant professor by uh, 20, 20, 20, 2001, seven years, he became a full professor. Um, he uh, started his work from uh, ACAT in the wake of uh, the important discovery of ACAT-1, which some of you have heard uh, on Monday. He made the first ACAT uh, knockout, um, and then uh, he discovered ACAT-2, but his work really took off after he uh, got involved in, uh, uh, started the working on DGAT and the TAG synthesis. Just allow me to use a couple of slides to, to uh, introduce him. So uh, just quickly, so this is the uh, uh, TAG synthesis pathways uh, in, in human cells. Uh, the key enzyme is the DGAT, which is the terminal enzyme in the synthesis of triacylglycerol. And there's a monoacylglycerol pathway which predominates in the uh, uh, intestine. And Bob Klung identified and uh, uh, Klung then categorized uh, both forms of DGAT and also uh, most of the MGAT isoforms. And uh, he made mouse models and he, his work uh, uh, turned some of these enzymes into f uh, highly uh, interesting drug targets. I believe uh, uh, many of the companies have uh, programs targeting DGAT1, and some of, some of the chemicals now probably at phase three clinical trials. And uh, after that, uh, after uh, doing all this biochemistry and the physiology, Bob decided to study the next step in uh, lipid, storage <coughs> lipid storage. Because once the TAG is made, it's stored in, uh, sorry, it's, all, it's actually here, stored in lipid droplets. Okay, so uh, uh, lipid droplets has long been known as just inert storage organelles, but uh, uh, recently has been recognized as an important organelle. So, so this is a little cartoon I drew up last year that, you know, uh, much of this actually based on Bob's work. So, um, you know, there's a control, it's a challenge, it's a major challenge now to, to as to where uh, lipid droplets come from and exactly how it bought out of the ER. And, and, you know, but, but from Bob's work now, we have very good understanding as to how uh, droplets grow. I, I think he will tell you today. And also uh, how droplets may fuse. And I heard that he's going to, he may have a big story on this in terms of the budding of the uh, lipid droplets. So based on these slides, it's uh, uh, fair to, <laughs> to <laughs> for me to say that uh, Bob is a, uh, uh, fierce warrior against human obesity. Please welcome Bob. Okay, thank you very, can you hear me? Is this on? In the back, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Rob, uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, and a photograph we took yesterday while <laughs> visiting uh, Suzhou. Uh, I want to express my thanks to Bao Liang and uh, Mori, Karen, and David for the invitation. Uh, I'm very honored to give the keynote lecture. Uh, especially with all these great scientists here. And uh, I want to say at the outset, though, I'm here that I'm not only representing myself in this keynote lecture, but I'm also representing Tobias Walter. Uh, Toby and I have been working together for over seven years now. 
uh, since I did my sabbatical in Peter Walter's lab. And uh, our work grows closer and closer, and we virtually supervise all projects together now. So I'm speaking on behalf of both of us and, and accept this honor on behalf of both of us. Um, I also accept, uh, want to uh, point out I'm speaking on behalf of several very talented graduate students, Joel Haas, Natalie Kramer, Florian Wilfling, and a very talented biophysics postdoctoral fellow, Rashid Tiam, and I'll be presenting work from all of them today. Okay, so the basic introduction is we're interested in energy metabolism, and uh, life itself is defined by the open equilibrium of energy, where generally living systems have a balance of energy intake and energy expenditure. However, because energy is not always available, there has to be means to store energy for times of starvation or fasting, for example, or, or use like an exercise. And the major form of storage for energy is in triacylglycerol. And this depicts the relative amounts of lipid stores per carbohydrate stores in an average human. It's roughly to scale for that. However, when energy is in excess, uh, the supply of energy is in excess uh, in res with respect to its utilization, there is an increase in the triglyceride stores and we get obesity. And this is a big problem in the United States and many other worlds where we tend to eat a lot of foods that are rich in fats and sugar. And as a result, the definition of what a regular guy has changed quite a bit in our country. And this is a billboard I saw uh, outside the Atlanta airport. And if you go to the Atlanta airport, this indeed is what the regular guy looks like. So sorry, my pointer is over there. Okay. Now, we have, uh, unlike what you would see in the Netherlands or in Denmark or places like that where it's a, a nice alternative to keep up your energy expenditure, we have funny ways of dealing with this in the United States, and it's quite a contrast, I think. Right. So we have funny ways of exercise. Now, the implications of triglyceride storage uh, are large. Uh, <laughs> didn't mean to pun that, but uh, uh, this is basically triglyceride excess and lipid droplet excess on the left. And the problem with this is lipotoxicity and the spillover into other tissues, as you've heard a lot about in this meeting. And so understanding this process at a fundamental level is important. In addition, there's a lot of interest in triglyceride storage in industry where uh, many people are interested in engineering either crops or biofuels to generate more hydrocarbons for uh, utilization. So the work also has implications for that. So I'm going to talk mostly about the organelle for lipid storage today, and a lot of the talks today's session are going to be on the lipid droplet. So this is a rat hepatoma show, cell showing you a, a lipid droplet full of, of uh, mostly triglycerides. It's bounded by a phospholipid monolayer. It's often in close proximity to the ER or to mitochondria, and it's schematically shown on the right with neutral lipid cores, triacylglycerols or cholesterol esters, for example, in the core, the monolayer phospholipids, and specific proteins that decorate the surface. Lipid droplets are ubiquitous amongst eukaryotic organisms. This is a green bodipi dye showing that you can see lipid droplets in uh, yeast cells, where there's about four to seven on average. Uh, fly cells, and these are murine adipocytes, where you see quite a diversity of size. They're also important in physiological processes, like fat absorption in the small intestine, where lipid droplets transiently hold the absorbed fat, and they're, absor and they're important, and they're extruded into the lumen of mammary epithelium, and basically are the milk fat uh, in a very interesting process uh, of apical secretion. And, of course, they're important in, in a disease. So adipose tissue that I've mentioned is largely lipid droplets. Macrophage foam cells are, lip, are macrophages full of cholesterol esters. And then we've heard a lot of talk at this meeting about hepatic steatosis, which, of course, is accumulation of, of lipid in these lipid droplets of various size. So uh, I'm going to talk mostly about triglyceride and not cholesterol ester in this talk. Triglyceride biosynthesis was worked out in the late 1950s, early 1960s by Eugene Kennedy and co-workers. It worked out at the pathways for a lot of the glycerol lipids. And the basic pathway for triglyceride synthesis is shown here. You start with a glycerol 3-phosphate, an enzyme glycerol phosphate acyl transferase acylates one of the chains. Then you have lysophosphatidic acid, and acylglycerol phosphate acyl transferase acylates a second chain to get phosphatidic acid. 
than lipin that you heard about from Karen yesterday, or a phosphatidic acid phosphatase hydrolyzes the phosphate group, and you have diacylglycerol. And this diacylglycerol can be uh, uh, a substrate, as you saw yesterday, for either phospholipids or for triacylglycerols via the DGAT enzymes. And our contributions to this really came uh, a number of years ago when we were uh, successful and, and uh, fortunate to clone the DGAT1 enzyme and then team up with the uh, workers at Calgene to clone the DGAT2 enzyme. And this shows schematically a schematic view of what they look like. DGAT1 has multiple transmembrane domains. Um, it's embedded in the ER. It, work, it dimerizes and it works as either a dimer or a tetramer. On, in contrast, DGAT2 uh, has a very different topology. That's actually been worked out experimentally by Scott Stone in my group. It's N and C termini face the, cyt uh, the cytosol, and it has this hairpin-like motif that embeds it in the, e in the ER. <clears throat> we know that DGAT1 and DGAT2 account for nearly all triglyceride synthesis. We've made the knockouts of these animals, and we've made double knockouts. And in the white, at if this is an experiment looking at adipocyte differentiation. These are wild-type adipocytes full of lipid droplets. If you knock out both DGATs, you get no lipid droplets, basically, although you do get full adipocyte differentiation. It's just fatless fat. The knockouts are quite interesting. They're very different phenotypes. The DGAT2 deletion is uh, lethal just after birth. Uh, mice are born. Uh, they're runted. They uh, have very, very low triglycerides, and they have a skin defect, uh, which is due to the loss of some essential fatty acids. And because of this, they lose water quickly to their environment, so they become rapidly dehydrated and die. So DGAT2 accounts for the vast majority of the triglyceride synthesis. In contrast, if you knock out DGAT1, which we actually did before DGAT2, but you get a mouse that's lean. These are two mice on the left that have been fed a high-fat diet for a number of weeks, and you can appreciate the DGAT1 knockout mouse is lean. Uh, they're, they have reduced body fat, usually about 50% on most diets. Uh, they have delayed fat absorption, increased energy expenditure, and they're resistant to diet-induced obesity, insulin-resistance, fatty liver. And we recently completed a study that shows that they have an extended lifespan of about 25%. So because of all these favorable uh, characteristics, as Rob mentioned, there's been a lot of interest in pharmaceutical inhibitors of the DGAT enzyme. Um, for these types of indications, postprandial lipidemia, obesity, diabetes, and I won't talk about it today, but DGAT1's been linked to hepatitis C replication as well. Um, and so uh, as a result, a number of pharmaceutical companies have developed DGAT1 inhibitors. These are three pharmaceutical companies that have developed inhibitors that have made it into human trials. Uh, the furthest along is Novartis, the LCQ908, which is now in phase three clinical trials. Now, if you find all these DGAT uh, effects appealing, uh, but you don't want to wait for these inhibitors, I came across this website when I was browsing uh, on DGAT inhibitors, and I found that there is a, naturally, there is a natural compound, CNL here, which inhibits DGAT, and you can get it from this website. It's all about women, and uh, it will reduce your body fat and make you feel like this woman here. Um, I don't know anything about that other than that, though. I just found it very interesting that it's already out in the popular uh, media. So it turns out, though, there's a problem. And the problem is that, uh, you know, up until recently, we had no, in, no um, information about DGAT1 deficiency in humans. Uh, pharmaceutical companies were working on it. But uh, I'll just mention brief, briefly that we published a paper last fall uh, in collaboration with researchers at Harvard at MGH where we identified a uh, family that has homozygous deficiency of DGAT1. The family is of Ashkenazi Jewish background. They live in Brazil. And I'm just going to summarize it briefly. They had three children. Uh, the first ch child was normal. Uh, the second child uh, developed diarrhea the day after birth. It was severe diarrhea. This child had to be supplemented with nutrition. And after about 17 months, died of uh, complications from the intravenous uh, therapies. They had a second child, which is the one that came to attention, who had the same phenotype. The day after birth, uh, this child started having severe intractable diarrhea. And fortunately, this child, uh, after several years of support, nutritional support, is now doing quite well. So this child is, I think, approximately three years old now and, and thriving. 
Um, it turned out that the way they were identified was they had this syndrome. Uh, it, brought the, brought, it was brought to the attention of Harland Winter, who's a pediatric gastroenterologist, and he collaborated with Mark Daly at Harvard, a geneticist, and they did exome sequencing, and they found a splice donor site mutation where the GT was changed to a GC. And as a result, uh, from the splice donor site mutation, exon 9 splices to exon 7, you get a deletion of exon 8, and exon 8 encodes 25 amino acids, or about 5% of the protein. And this protein is dead, and we checked that out, and it's all published, so I'm not going to go into it in detail. Um, so we have new news about DGAT1 deficiency from human genetics, and that is that uh, DGAT1 deficiency can cause, is a cause of congenital diarrhea syndrome. Uh, we don't understand the mechanism fully. It involves enterocyte dysfunction. The electron micrographs from these children uh, show enterocytes that don't look very healthy at all. Um, it's interesting because uh, in their phase two clinical studies that Novartis did, uh, this, they published uh, results on the web. And if you look at what happens, they took about 700 subjects who were taking metformin, another, uh, so they were diabetic. And they put them on this DGAT1 inhibitor. And with increasing doses of DGAT1 inhibitor, you see there's an increase in side effect that's dose-related and it's diarrhea. So this is likely due to DGAT1 deficiency. We have some insight into what happens here. Now, the mice that we knocked out DGAT1 had no diarrhea, no fat malabsorption at all. And we think this is due to a species difference. Because if you look at mice in their small intestine, so here's the mouse DGAT1 and DGAT2 expression in the small intestine you see both enzymes are expressed. So if you knock out DGAT1, you still have DGAT2. In contrast, in humans, uh, here's DGAT1 expression, but there's virtually no DGAT2 expression. So if you inhibit DGAT1, you don't have a backup enzyme, and we presume that that's part of the problem. There's sort of a lipotoxic event that happens to these enterocytes. Um, that said, most of the subjects that took it did not stop the study, and uh, Novartis is pushing ahead with the, uh, going for FDA approval of this drug. Uh, in, in patients with very high triglyceride levels. Okay, I'm going to shift gears now. As Rob mentioned, uh, a number of years ago, I was working on DGAD enzymes and physiology and disease, but I got quite curious about uh, the cell biology that happens here. And the rest of the talk, I'm going to tell you about some of, the, some of our cell biological findings. So these enzymes basically make oil in the ER, in the bilayer of the ER. And I became curious about how you get oil from a bilayer into a monolayer bound vesicle. And this led me to a sabbatical with Peter Walter, and that's where I met Toby, and that's where we started our work together. And so what I'm going to do in the rest of the time here is I'm going to talk to you um, primarily about two stories. One concerns how lipid droplets grow and enlarge, and the other is concerns protein targeting to lipid droplets. The last part is, uh, this part here is just published this past month. This part is un as yet unpublished, and so actually it's the first time I'm presenting it, so I'll be interested to see, uh, see what uh, reaction you have. <laughs> um, okay, so first question is, how do lipid droplets grow? And what I'm talking about here is uh, starting with a small droplet that grows into a larger droplet, and this is distinct from fusion or coalescence of lipid droplets, and Pong Li will, I'm sure, be telling us about protein catabolized fusion and coalescence. So I'm making a distinction here, just expansion of a droplet. OK, so theoretically, to grow, you have to do two things. You have to add triacylglycerols to expand this core, and then you have to add phospholipids to coat the surface, basically making an emulsion in the cell. And I want to say that the only w we've made some progress in understanding this now. And the only way we would we've made progress is because we've done systems-wide um, like genomic and proteomic type approaches. And they've, from this, we've come up with things we never would have thought of, that were involved in these processes. And so uh, all the rest of this really derives from those kind of approaches. In particular, we've used the Drosophila cell system uh, to great uh, benefit. So Drosophila, these are Drosophila S2 cells. And they have some lipid droplets, as you can see, stained by Bodipi. If you load them with oleate and you take uh, time-lapsed images over 12 hours, you see that the droplets initially, some of them grow. Um, there are more of them. And then they eventually cluster into these uh, grape-like structures. OK, so 
because we had this nice phenotype we could screen, we did an RNAi genome-wide screen. And basically, this was published several years ago. But it's a fairly rich screen in terms of the output. And we're still getting a lot of information out of it. And what was very gratifying is that when we, when we binned out the different phenotypes we, we saw, they binned into different classes. You know, small, few droplets, big droplets, big and clustered droplets, et cetera. And we found about 225 genes that altered droplet morphology. And gratifyingly, there were, uh, for example, in this class, there's a bunch of proteasome subunits and spliceosome subunits, which we still don't understand. But basically, they binned out in functional categories as well, which gave us confidence that our screen was useful. And I'll come back to a couple of the hits here. The other thing that we um, have, taken, have used to great effect is mass spectrometry. And this is something that Toby picked up when he did his stint in, in, in uh, Munich, where he was located close to Matthias Mann. In particular, uh, what we've done is used a technique called pro protein correlation profiling. And we've used SILAC labeling to, to basically compare the lipid droplet fraction across all other fractions derived from the cell so that we can get an idea of what peptides are enriched in the lipid droplet fraction and get a higher confidence can tell with higher confidence that these are indeed proteins that are in the lipid droplet fraction. This is the problem because mass spec is so sensitive now. You find so many peptides, and so you have to have some way to figure out what they are. And by doing this protein, you get different protiles, profiles for different proteins in the cell. For, so for example, here's, here's the clustering for membrane Golgi apparatus, or membrane ER, which has some overlap with the lipid droplet. But the lipid droplet proteins are primarily all down here in fraction one. So we recently published for this for the Drosophila proteome, and we're working on it in some, several other cell types. Now, one of the things that uh, when we got the, the lipid droplet proteome, they've been out into some different classes. And I want to pay attention right now to this class, which is triglyceride synthesis enzymes. So in doing so, we found a GPAT and an LPAT. We found lipin, for example, that came out in the lipid droplet proteome. And so basically, we found all each of these enzymes has multiple isoforms. And we found one isoform of this enzyme, one of this enzyme, one of this enzyme, and one of this, that all were part of the lipid droplet proteome. We went, tagged these proteins. For those where we had antibodies, we looked at endogenous proteins. And we showed that under oleate loading, GPAT4, this should be AGPAT3, and DGAT2, all, they're all tagged in cherry here, surround these green stained Bodipi lipid droplets. And they do so in a very interesting manner. They move to lipid droplets because initially, before the cells have oleate, they overlap extensively with SEC61, so they overlap with an ER marker. Then as the lipid droplets start to grow, there's segregation of GPAT4 around the lipid droplets. So by eight hours, you get these large lipid droplets where all the GPAT4 is concentrated. We've extensively used GPAT4 as our marker for these expanding large lipid droplets. And you see it's segregated away from the SEC61 marker. I'm just showing you some of the highlights of this paper because it's recently published. We know that, or believe that GPAT4 is, is really on the lipid droplet. This is immunogold labeling showing you GPAT4 at the surface of lipid droplets and not, for example, on ER that's um, surrounding it. And we've worked out the topology of GPAT4, uh, which was originally thought to be, have a transmembrane domain. But our data suggests that it, it looks like the DGAT and DGAT2 enzyme that I showed you earlier where it has a hydrophobic patch, and then it has a hairpin motif that embeds it in the membrane, and then a catalytic domain uh, down here. So what we believe happens is these are electron micrographs of the S2 cells during the lipid loading. And what we see is that there are small lipid droplets, but there are also these expanding lipid droplets. And these expanding lipid droplets have contacts that are blown up here, where the ER, that's decorated by ribosomes, comes into contact with the surface of lipid droplets. So here's two parts of the ER. And presumably, the inner membrane of the ER is, is, is in here. And the outer membrane is contiguous with the lipid droplet surface. And so our model for what happens now for these isoenzymes is shown here, that they are normally located in the ER. But under conditions of fat excess, they migrate over via membrane bridges onto the surface of lipid droplets. And there, they're able to catalyze the triglyceride synthesis and the expansion of selected droplets. And so predictions from this model are that, if, that there should be two different populations of droplets, those that don't have GPAP4 and those enzymes and those that do. And so what we see is that 
there are two, in fact, two populations. Uh, one that has GPAT4, and these grow over time. This is a cross-sectional analysis, but they grow over time. We've shown droplet, uh, that droplets do grow in videos. Um, and then there's another population that don't grow. So we have a so-called smaller population and an expanding pop, uh, a population of expanded lipid droplets. And so another prediction is that if you get rid of GPAP4, you wouldn't get those large droplets. And this is what we find. So this is Drosophila cell loaded with oleate. You have a population of small droplets and some large droplets. And it gives you a bimodal distribution when looking at lipid droplet diameter. If you knock out GPAP4, you lose the large droplets. If you knock out AGPAT3, you lose the large droplets. If you knock out DGAT2, you lose the large droplets. If you knock out the ER enzymes, you don't. So I'm not going to show them here. They're all, it's all in the paper. OK, so we begin to uh, have an idea of how the neutrolipids are added to the core of specific droplets. So the other question is, how are phospholipids added to this core? Because in order to uh, create a metastable emulsion, we need to add uh, surfactants like phospholipids. And we know from our studies in Drosophila cells that if we incubate them with oleate, uh, if you just look at total, total cellular phosphatidylcholine biosynthesis, it goes up about twofold over 24 hours, the cellular content of PC. So presumably, most of this PC is going to coat the newly formed lipid droplets. So here again, our uh, proteome was helpful, because in this lipid droplet proteome, this class down here all has to do with phospholipid metabolism. And in particular, uh, one that we were interested in is CCT enzyme. Uh, which is very important in the synthesis of phosphatidylcholine. So the CCT enzyme indeed targets to, the lip, some, to some lipid droplets. And so that's shown here. CCT is normally found in the nucleus, and it circulates in and out of the nucleus. However, after loading with oleate, you can see it decorating the surfaces of some of the larger droplets in the cell. So it's the larger droplets. And I won't show you the data, but it turns out it's the same droplets that have GPAP4, so the same expanding droplet population. <clears throat> so what is CCT? So again, this is uh, Eugene Kennedy's uh, work in elucidating out, and co-workers, in elucidating this pathway, in this case of glycerol lipids with uh, phosphatidylcholine, a polar, more polar lipid. So basically, choline is activated by ATP and CTP in this rate-limiting step where phosphocholine uh, is uh, reacts with CTP to form CDB choline is catalyzed by the C CCT enzyme. The final step of this reaction is, is, car is carried out by this enzyme, which use, utilizes diacylglycerol, and this part happens in the ER membrane. This part is water soluble. So from our screen, also, we had the um, finding that amongst the proteins that binned out in this last class, we had the CCT protein and several others involved in lipid synthesis that in Drosophila are likely involved in phosphatidyl, uh, phospholipid synthesis and uh, PE as well as PC. And what we see is that when you knock out CCT1, you get this phenotype of giant lipid droplets. And we believe that what happens when you knock out CCT in Drosophila cells is the reason you get giant lipid droplets is that they tend to coalesce. So here's a time-lapse image showing two droplets side by side that now are coming together and then fuse to form this larger droplet. And what we think happens is shown schematically here. You start with small droplets that are coated, let's say, with phospholipids. But then as lipid droplet expansion happens and you fill the cores with triacylglycerols, there's a period or a window where there's relatively insufficient PC to coat the droplet surface. As a result, there's a high surface tension. And high surface tension uh, wants resolution, so you get coalescence of these droplets to form a large droplet. And this is actually a, a, a well-known uh, feature of oil emulsions. So you can take triacylglycerol oil, emulsify it, and it quickly coalesces into a giant droplet. If you add phosphatidylethanolamine, it does the same thing. PE cannot serve to emulsify this well, at least at room temperature. And PC, however, does, you are able to form an emulsion. So this is like canola oil. This is like PAM. And this is uh, an experiment where T TAG, PE, and PC are all added at ratios uh, consistent with what's found in Drosophila cells. OK, so we published this a, a, about a year and a half ago. And basically, what we think happens is this. As the droplet expands, it has relative PC deficiency. CCT is circulating in and out of the nucleus. 
It binds to the surface. It recognizes uh, PC deficient surfaces and membranes. It binds via an amphipathic helix. Upon binding, it becomes activated and it catalyzes the rate limiting step. And then the f and that generates CDP choline. And the last step then to generate PC happens in the ER, as I mentioned. And then PC is, is somehow transferred to the surfaces of droplets in a process we don't fully understand uh, to cause the surface to become a replete again. And CCT is no longer bound to the, to the droplet. So what I've shown you so far here is that we now have a, uh, some insight that we didn't have before. And that is we, we believe that there are at least two kinds of droplets um, that are sort of fundamental to most cells as we find these processes in most cells. We find it in Drosophila cells, and we also find it in mammalian cells. And that is that most cells make small droplets, uh, presumably through the actions of ER-catalyzed enzymes. But then there are a population of droplets that are capable of expansion because they have migration of these enzymes to their surfaces. And those, those droplets then have activation of CCT to maintain the phosphatidylcholine on those surfaces. OK, so the large droplets, as I said, the growth is mediated by the relocation. The surface expansion is mediated by CCT. OK, so in the last part here, I'm going to uh, tell you about a, uh, some unpublished findings that um, we think are quite interesting and, and add, add to this uh, evolving, uh, interesting life of lipid droplets. OK, so part of the question that we've been interested in is how do proteins target to the surfaces of lipid droplets? So there's many proteins that target there. You're familiar with many of them, like lipases, the enzymes I just showed you, GPAP4, and so forth, the perilipins. Uh, so there's a number of mechanisms most likely at play. Some of the proteins use amphipathic helices and bind to the phospholipids. Um, I'm going to talk about a particular class of proteins that, that migrate on to the lipid droplets and a mechanism we think that's involved in their migration there. So we got this story started again with our RNA I screen. And in the screen, in this class, uh, we also had very few genes. We had basically eight genes. And they were all members of uh, vesicular transport machinery. So we had ARF 79F, which is the Drosophila ortholog of ARF1. We had GARS, which is the guanine, guanine nucleotide exchange factor. And we had several COP1 subunits. And I'll tell you about what these do in a, in a minute. But basically, it was interesting. They all gave the same phenotype of slightly large droplets that were dispersed in the cell. OK. Uh, it was very specific. So we looked at a bunch of different ARFs, and we found this phenotype only for our 79 f and not for others. Uh, we found it for GARS, but not for other guanine uh, nucleotide exchange factors. And we found it for uh, these six COP subunits, but for example, not in epsilon COP. And we did not find this phenotype in COP2 uh, transport, which is for ER to Golgi transport vesicles. Another interesting clue we had is that when we knocked down ARF and COP, they have these dispersed lipid droplets. And they also have an impairment in mobilizing their triglycerides. So basically, what we do here is we culture an oleate for 24 hours. They become fully loaded. Then we remove the oleate. And within a couple days, a wild-type cell consumes its triglycerides. And this was markedly slowed when you lacked ARF, uh, ARF proteins or COP proteins. And this is quantified here in, in terms of glycerol release into the media. So it's much less when you knock down these proteins. So what's going on? Uh, so after we published this, shortly after that, uh, Matthias Beller and colleagues, and also uh, the Bonificino group and Sony, uh, published a study showing that if you knock down ARF COP, you have less ATGL on lipid droplets. And so we've confirmed that in this experiment here. This is Drosophila cells now. Here's lipid droplets loaded with oleate. You see ATGL binds and uh, surrounds the lipid droplet. However, if you knock down one of the COP subunits, now you get this dispersed phenotype. And now ATGL has very weak binding. And you can see it's mostly redistributed to the cytoplasm. OK, so we also took a look at GPAP4. The enzyme I told you earlier that catalyzes the first and rate limiting step in triglyceride synthesis. And we found the same thing for GPAP4. So here's lipid droplets. GPAP4 normally targets these large lipid expanding lipid droplets. See it very nicely here. If you knock down COP, you get this phenotype. Now GPAP4 is mostly localized in the ER, and it's not present at the lipid droplets. And interestingly, what we found is that all the same subunits for, uh, held true for GPAP4. So you could knock down six of these subunits, and they, and they uh, abrogate. Actually, here's seven. But they abrogate 
uh, GPAP4 targeting the lipid droplets, whereas the Epsilon COP still targets the lipid droplets. This is the same as for, um, same as we saw for the phenotype of lipid droplet in the RNA ice cream. So this presents a question. What do the RF COP proteins do that enable targeting of specific proteins to the droplet surfaces, such as ATGL, which hydrolyzes neutrolipids, or GPAP4, which is involved in the synthesis of neutrolipids? OK, so if you know about RF COP proteins, you know that they are involved in vesicular transport. The COP2 vesicles are involved in ER to Golgi transport, moving proteins and lipids to the Golgi. The COP1 vesicles are involved in retrograde transport, RF1 in particular, and the COP proteins back to the ER. And the way ARF works is it's a, it's a GTPase. Uh, in its active form, it's bound to GTP and it recruits COP proteins. Uh, GTPase activating proteins promote GTP hydrolysis to the GDP binding form and exchange factors such as GBF or GARS, the one I showed you, catalyze exchange of this GTP for, a GDP, for the GTP and activate the protein. And so basically the way these work on the membrane then is there's a guanine, guanine nucleotide exchange catalyzed by GARS or GBF1. The active form binds COP and then COP proteins help to deform the membrane into 80 nanometer vesicles for this transport. So that's, that's all textbook stuff. We found one sub, this subunit, this subunit, and six of these subunits that all give abnormal protein targeting. So this presented us with two models. One model is that it's sort of the conventional model, that these proteins bind to things like ATGL or GPAP4 in vesicles. Then they migrate, they fuse with a lipid droplet, and they transfer the protein over to the surface. You can see that this is uh, conceivable, but it sort of pre presents a problem because now you have a hemifusion of a bilayer with a monolayer membrane. In contrast, we've always been attracted to in this other model, that lipid droplet surfaces are like membrane, other membrane surfaces and that the RF cop proteins may act directly on the lipid droplet surface to bud 60 to 80 nanometer lipid droplets and modify the lipid surface. By doing that, if you remove phospholipids like phosphatidylcholine, you would raise surface tension and then you allow proteins to bind to the surfaces. And part of the reason we were attracted to this model is, is several years ago, uh, in, the, in our original screen, we used a dominant negative ARF that binds very tightly to its GEF. And we noticed that if you bleach the cell, the fluorescent ARF was still localized or in these circles, which are lipid droplets in the cell. So it suggested that ARF might be binding directly at the lipid droplet surface. More recently, we've used microscopy to examine this more carefully for different COP subunits or GBF1, the, the GEF. And you can see that here's some bodipistein droplets. And this one particular droplet has a co-localization signal, for example. And here's a bodipistein droplet where uh, GBF1 is co-localized. Now, these proteins are not primarily at lipid droplets. They're primarily in Golgi vesicles. But st we've done statistical analysis to show that this binding is not just a bunch of dots that overlap. There's an enrichment that you wouldn't expect if you just did a random, a random type of overlap. And so that quantification is shown here. If you look at beta cop, for example, there's, a, there's an enrichment of uh, found in experimentals per simulation of co-localization as compared with controls like clathrin or the KDEL receptor, with any, which, if anything, are, are less prominent at, uh, uh, in terms of overlap with lipid droplets. So we believe that the RF cop proteins do localize to the surface of lipid droplets. The other key experiment <coughs> that led to this hypothesis came from Rashid TM, who is, uh, I mentioned earlier, he works with Fr uh, Fred Pr uh, Pince and, J and Jim Rothman. And Rashid is a biophysics uh, expert and basically works with microfluidics. And he does this cool, cool experiment in microfluidics where he takes oil and phospholipid mixture and he makes reverse lipid droplets of water inside the oil. So basically you have oil, phospholipid, and then water inside. And he can, using the microfluidic devices, he can reconstitute into, for example, every other drop here, uh, a fluorescently labeled R ARF with COP proteins and a GTP. And that's, that's shown, for example, here. And what you see is that the ARF protein localizes to the monolayer uh, surface in that vesicle in the presence of GTP. So that's, that shows just very simply that the ARF proteins can bind to a monolayer surface in the presence of GTP. 
He then went on to purify the contents of these vesicles and look at them by electron microscopy. And basically what he found is that there are many small, around 60 nanometer uh, nano droplets, we call them, uh, that are formed in the presence of ATP. This is um, coated droplets because they have the cop coats. And you can add the ARF gap, which, hyd which causes hydrolysis and the coats released, and then you get these nice nano droplets. So we believe this is evidence then for this model that ARF-COP proteins bind directly to the surface of lipid droplets. They remove phospholipids. They alter the surface uh, biophysical properties. And this allows proteins to target. So there's a couple predictions of this. I'll just show you these, and then I'm done. Um, <clears throat> so basically, we have an equilibrium where if you add PC or upregulation of the enzyme that makes PC, you drive coating of PC on the droplet. On the other hand, ARF-COP proteins are removing PC and allowing proteins to target. So this predicts, for example, if you don't have ARF-COP proteins, you don't target. We've shown, I've shown you that. It also predicts if you take this situation and now you block this situation, you would have no need for the ARF-COP proteins because you'd already be deplete and you would get targeting. And so this is indeed what we see. This is the GPAP4 assay binding to large droplets. It doesn't happen if you knock down R for COP. It does happen if you knock down CCT and they're, and they're PC deficient. But now what if you combine them? Well, you combine PC deficiency on top of ARF and COP, and now you restore targeting of GPAP4 to these droplets, which normally doesn't occur. So that's consistent with this model. Another uh, way to test the model is <clears throat> shown here. We can add, uh, if you knock out ARF-COP, you would not get targeting. But if you add a surfactant to the surfaces of the lipid droplets that don't do a good job as a surfactant, don't completely cover. So in this case, we're using cholesterol. It has a small head group as compared to phosphatidylcholine. That predicts that that might drive the targeting of GPAP4. And basically, that's shown in this experiment. So normally, GPAP4 targets to droplets. Doesn't happen when you knock out COP. If you add a lot of PC, it doesn't target in either case. But if you add free cholesterol, 5 millimolar concentrations, a uh, fair amount of this cholesterol makes it to the surface of lipid droplets, and now GPAP4 targeting is restored. And this happens even in the absence of the COP proteins. So we believe that, that so far our evidence supports this model, um, that the ARF-COP proteins play a major role in modifying the surface of lipid droplets. And this is important for the targeting of some proteins to lipid droplets, like GPAP4 and ATGL. So just some highlights. I've shown you um, lipid droplets grow via act Lo actions of localized TG synthesis enzymes. The phospholipids are maintained via CCT activation. And the phospholipids are removed from the surface of lipid droplets via ARF-COP, allowing protein some proteins to target. It's not true of all proteins, but it's true of the ones that I've shown you here. So to close, I'd just say I've shown you a lot of cell biology now where we have new insights to how lipids are stored within cells. And what we'd, what we'd like to do now is take this back to physiology and be able to see what all this means for, physi uh, for disease, physiology and disease. So for example, in America, there's over 30 million people that have um, steatosis or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And a good proportion of them go on to develop steatohepatitis. So now we can begin to ask questions, or what are the roles of different lipid classes in this disease process? What is the role of PC? What is the role of ARF-COP and other surface modulators in generating this uh, inflammatory state or lipotoxicity? And so those are the kind of things that we'll be doing uh, to complement the cell biology in the next couple of years. I'll close just by showing the picture of our two groups. Toby's group is at Yale. I'm at UCSF. We have joint lab retreats. Um, there's some redundancy in these pictures. But uh, this is Toby's group, and this is my group with part of his group at our last lab retreat a few months ago. And uh, I think I've pointed out the members of the laboratory in large part who have contributed to the work here. Uh, Yi Guo, I will mention in particular, did the uh, RNAi screen that's been so helpful. And uh, I think I've mentioned the others. Um, I've mentioned our collaborators. Uh, we were helped by the microscopists at Yale, both the electron microscopists as well as the super resolution microscopists. Matthias Mann, Rosalind Coleman provided us with GPAP4 knockout mice. And I didn't show Kim's data, but she's provided us also with some mice that have been very helpful. So with that, I will uh, close. And I thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions. That's very nice, Bob. Uh, so uh, of course, uh, a lot of these hairpin proteins 
uh, have a preference either to cause curvature or to go to curved membranes. And I wondered if you've uh, seen any of that with, say, the DGAT2 or the other protein that you mentioned that has a hairpin. Uh, and are those selectively recruited, say, to these uh, budding vesicles or even to the small droplets as they form? Yeah, that's an interesting idea. We don't have any evidence for that, but it is, uh, it, it's worth thinking about how we could ex test that experimentally. Really nice, uh, Bob. Um, I'm wondering if you considered the possibility that the lipid droplets actually form either in ergic or in the cis-golgi. Because, of course, as you, as you alluded, COP1 is pr principally responsible for retrograde transport. And the reason I ask is that I remember when, we, when I used to collaborate with Jan Slot, you know, doing EM on various cells, you often see lipid droplets right in the middle of the Golgi apparatus, which nobody ever was able to understand. Yeah, the only data I have, uh, we have some data that address that. I didn't show it today. It's a project we're still working on in cost cells. And it's about nascent lipid droplets. And we see nascent lipid droplets very closely associated with the ER. And at least with the one Golgi marker we've used, it's not, it's not associated with Golgi. That's not to say that mature droplets might not associate with the Golgi, though. And then I guess the second possibility is that maybe the retrograde pathway is simply bringing factors back to the ER that are required for lipid droplet formation in the ER. So it's an indirect effect rather than a direct effect. Yeah, so they're not, they're not required for the formation. What we know they're required for is the targeting of specific proteins. So then I think, you know, Basically, for us, that boils down to models where they're either they're, the vesicles are, are used in trafficking these proteins or they're acting directly at the lipid droplet surface. And our data all favor the second. Thanks. Hey, Bob, really great. Um, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> the, the lipid composition of the various droplets is obviously it's pretty incomplete at this point, and it's been kind of controversial. But, but there are other lipid components there. And, Enzymes, for example, enzymes involved in eicosanoid bio biosynthesis have been implicated in being associated with lipid droplet. And I'm wondering if from your screen you could give us any feel for how other lipids are getting there. Are they being synthesized? Is their synthesis part of a growing lipid droplet? Or is it really, do you think it's all triglyceride? Uh, well, I think the, the cores are neutral lipids for the most part, or things that are like bodipi that are soluble in neutral lipids, maybe fat-soluble vitamins and other, other things like that, retinol esters and so forth. The surface, though, could have a lot of different lipids, I think. But even uh, cholesterol and things like yeah. that, do you think? You know, cholesterol, is, there's usually not much of it, but when we load with cholesterol here, uh, we can purify the droplets and show that it got there. Okay. So I think under certain cir circumstances, yeah, this sort of changes things, right? Because, you know, maybe you don't normally find any sphingolipid-related lipids to any measurable degree there, but under certain circumstances, you might. Okay. So I, I think it, it, it's, and those things might modify the surface. Two questions. The first question is, uh, uh, you said the CTT can synthesize PC on lipid droplet surface. And my question is, uh, uh, do you know where, is the, uh, uh, where, where, the, where does the uh, substrate of CTT come from? The substrates for the CCT enzyme are water soluble. Oh. So they're, in the, they're presumably in the cytosol. My second question is, uh, um, you said that GPAD can synthesize uh, uh, TEG on, on, on large lipid droplets, but uh, uh, you, you, you did a, the experiment only in the uh, uh, S2 cells. Maybe it's, uh, in the, you know in the S2 cells they only have small uh, lipid droplets. I, 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 I want to know uh, whether it have a similar mechanism in the a deep, stu uh, a, a deep size. In adipocytes, yeah. Uh, we haven't looked directly in adipocytes. We've looked in fibroblasts yeah. and macrophages and hepatoma cells. And the, in large part, everything I've described is present in those cells. Adipocytes, I think, are special, and we'll hear about other proteins they have that change their lipid droplet geometry. Yeah. Okay. Or maybe it's not geometry, whatever it is. Volume. Last question. Okay. 
I, I have a question for, for the lipid job lead uh, protein targeting to, to this. So what, what do you think, what determines um, uh, a protein that will target the lipid job lead? Is there a conserved motif or kind of uh, properties of the protein? Yeah, very, uh, 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 very interesting question. That's, that's, uh, there seem to be classes, hairpin motifs, like I showed you. Caviolin is another one, for example. Um, amphipathic helices, but it's not known what about those amphipathic helices target a lipid droplet versus other membranes. And then proteins that have hydrophobic domains or lipid anchors. But I think a lot of people are studying this to try to understand better the determinants because it's not clear at this point. Okay, uh, let's thank Bob for a wonderful presentation. <laughs>